scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. On page 807 of the Bible of the Jews. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are going to continue our look here at different perspectives on Christmas. And today, we're going to be looking at the Magi. This is the same text that we looked at last week, and we examined... Herod and his perspective. So this week it's going to be a very different perspective as we look at the visit of the wise men. So before we dive into this text, why don't we go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your mercy and your grace. And we are grateful that you have sent your Son. Lord, without Jesus, we would all be doomed. And yet you sent the Savior of the world, the one who would rescue his people from their sins. And we rejoice in his birth in this time of year. I pray today as we open the word that your people would hear from you. Father, they don't need my words today. They need the words of Christ. And Father, I pray that you would speak through the power of your Holy Spirit today. Encourage us, challenge us, and help us to once again see afresh the greatness of the Savior, Jesus. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. You know, many of our stories around Christmas are more folklore than they are actual fact. Uh, consider the picture of Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem and Mary was riding on a donkey. Never mentioned in scripture. There might have been a donkey. There might not have. It's probably more likely that she was riding in a cart, uh, given the bumpy roads and conditions like that. Here's another one. Uh, oh, th this one's maybe the most notorious of all, them all. Uh, the little Lord Jesus, what? no crying he makes. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's never mentioned in Scripture either. It's interesting that when Jesus gets to be an adult, he cries, but he never cried when he was a child. So, again, I think that's more fable than actual fact. How about this one? Um, the famous conversation between Joseph and the innkeeper. He gets there and, you know, he's pleading for a place to pl stay and the innkeeper turns him away, right? Okay, not only is the innkeeper, that conversation not mentioned, there's no innkeeper in the Bible. And there's no really even inn. I mean, the, the word inn is actually like an upper room in a house. So it's not like he's checking into a Motel 6 and they're all booked up. Or, or maybe this one. The day we celebrate Christmas is on what? December 25th, Jesus' birthday, right? Well, probably not. 
It was most likely sometime in late September, because once it got past late September, shepherds no longer stayed in the fields. They went into the towns to stay there. So it, all I'm saying by that, this is neither here nor there. You know, the, uh, the, the, the foundation of our faith is not based on whether or not Mary rode a donkey. OK. But sometimes we need to be able to unravel what the truth of Scripture is versus the, the fictitious elements that we may have added. And, you know, I don't think any story around the nativity is more shrouded in fables and in folklore than it is about, you know, the the we three kings, right? Okay, first, number one, they weren't kings. They were magi. Number two, the Bible never says three. So I'm bursting your bubble already, but we need to look at what the scripture actually says about these guys, right? I mean, stories are good, and it's nice if you you have these little, uh, we have our nativity scenes and things like that. Those are all well and good, but bottom line is we need to be able to see what the Bible actually says about these men. So do we know anything about the wise men? The answer is yes, we do. But before I assert what we do know, let's be clear on what we don't, okay? First of all, three things that we don't know about the wise men. First of all, they are called wise men, okay? That's what they're called in the verse there. In Matthew, he tells us that wise men from the east appear on the scene. The Greek term is magi. So despite the title of the traditional Christmas carol, we three kings of Orient are, these were not kings, these were magi. And exactly where these men came from is, is been quite hotly debated. Some have argued that the magi were from Persia because some historians from the period make reference to a priestly class of men from Medo-Persia. And it's also clear that some Jews had contact with these men. Remember, Remember the story of Esther, if you've read your Old Testament? Esther became what? What was her position? Queen. And her uncle, Mordecai, became one of the chief people in the palace. And as you read the story of Esther, it becomes very clear that some Jewish people, some people who knew about the hope of the Messiah, had contact with these royal advisors who were often called magi or wise men. So maybe they were from Persia. Other people say, oh, no, 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 no. They couldn't have been from Persia because Persian people didn't know anything about astronomy. And how did the wise men find the baby Jesus? By following a, you know, where they studied astronomy. That was in Babylon. And actually, we know stuff about the Magi in Babylon. Remember, wasn't there a pretty significant guy in the Old Testament down there in Babylon by the name of Daniel? And Daniel, remember, he rose to being like second in command in all of the place. And and when he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Nebuchadnezzar was going to put to death all of the wise men. And guess who saved them? Daniel. Daniel, a Jew, did he know about the promise of Messiah coming? Did he have some influence with these wise men? Yes, absolutely. So could the wise men have been from Babylon? Well, maybe. There's one more opinion. This one's a little far-fetched. Have you heard this one? Some say, well, the wise men's names were Caspar, Balthazar, and Melchior. Their mamas must not have liked them, okay? (laughs) And what is more, they were baptized by the Apostle Thomas and eventually buried in Constantinople, moved to Milan, and eventually came to rest in Cologne, where they are still there today. That one's probably a flight of fancy, okay? Um, those are chiefly what you read out there about the wise men. But after Matthew chapter 2, guess what? Nothing. This is all we got. These little verses about the wise men. So were they from Persia? Were they from Babylon? Or did they come from all over parts of the world and Caspar, Balthazar, and Melchior gather together and travel to Bethlehem? We just don't know, though I wouldn't put my money on number three. What do we know about the wise men? We know that they were simply probably learned men that came somewhere from, what's the text say? The east. That's it. Could have been from Jersey. I don't know. (laughs) But they 
The Bible doesn't tell us any more than that. So that's the first thing we really don't know. The second thing that we don't know is the star. Inextricably linked to the story of the wise men is that they followed this star. And if you pick up commentaries and and all kinds of Bible literature on this, there is tons and tons of ink spilled on what this star was. Some people say, well, it was Jupiter. It was Jupiter because Jupiter is known as the king planet. And so Jupiter appeared extra bright in the sky, announcing the birth of a king. Great story. Another one say, well, Jupiter and Saturn actually came together at this time, and they they formed the sign of a fish. And as you know, the fish became a symbol for Christianity on down the road. And so therefore, this was announcing the birth of the king of the Christ- Christianity. So maybe that was it. Or perhaps it was a comet that was behaving erratically. And you know what? Guess what? Again, all of those things are possible. Because if you look at the astronomical records and things that were from back there, all of these things occurred somewhere closely to the estimated date of Christ. Although Halley's Comet, which is the one they say it might have been, was a little bit late. So probably not that one. The problem with all three of these positions is that the star in the story behaves rather unusually. Did you notice that? No ordinary occurrence of a star or a planet or really anything that we know about could do what happened in Matthew's gospel. Look at chapter 2, verse 9. After listening to the king, that is, after the magi listened to King Herod, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So here's what the star did. The star appeared, disappeared, reappeared, and went to be over somebody's house. I don't know about you. I'm not an expert astronomer, but no stars really do that, okay? That is not an ordinary occurrence of a star. Stars don't point out houses, okay? Okay? They don't lead you directly to a particular house. So, is it possible that Jupiter or Saturn Comet was involved in this process? Absolutely. But at the the end of the story, we have to say that God somehow directly intervened in this whole process. And he sent some sort of special sign to these magi. And in fact, it showed up at Jesus' house. Okay, I'm going to shoot another myth here. Did you hear the word I said? At Jesus' what? House. Not at the stable, which may or may not have been a stable, by the way. It was maybe a cave, too. Okay, I'm just shooting all these today. The, the Bible says he was in a manger. But this text says he was actually in a house. So the wise men probably were not there that night. They came at some later time. Some say probably around a year after when the, when the shepherds and the angels came. But the point simply is this. The star appears, it disappears, it reappears, and it appears over where the child is, over the house. This is God directly giving direction to the wise men. So what was the star? Again, the answer is we just don't know. Third thing we don't know. The king of the Jews. Did you notice that right in the first of the text? The wise men come, and who are they looking for? Where is he who is born the king of the Jews? Did that ever puzzle you? Because you have to ask this question. Are these people from Israel, yes or no? No. Do they have an exhaustive knowledge of the Old Testament, yes or no? No, because they they actually ask, where is he supposed to be born? And what do the scribes do? They get out the Bible and turn to Micah and say, well, Micah says that the king of the Jews is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So they didn't know that or or else they would have never gone to Jerusalem. If they knew that the baby was going to be born in Bethlehem, where would they have gone? Bethlehem, not stopped off in Jerusalem. So how did these men know that the king of the Jews was going to be born? Well, there's a couple of guesses again at this matter. It's possible that the Magi had access to some portions of the Old Testament. Now, here's what we have to remember. What do we call this? Not the Bible, but more generally. What do we call this? 
a book. You know, books haven't always been around. When Jesus taught in the synagogues, did he open up a book? What did he open up? A scroll. And did the scroll have the entire Bible on it? No. So is it possible that the wise men had some scrolls of the Old Testament, but not the whole thing? Yeah. And are there some texts in the Old Testament that connect the Messiah with the star? Well, maybe. Let me show you what I mean. Numbers 24. It's on your notes here. Numbers 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So this passage in Numbers 24 is definitely talking about the Messiah. Now, is there a reference to a star there? Yeah, maybe. It's veiled, but it could be there. Or another passage, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will, look at this word, this is critical, arise upon you. And his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And indeed, it seems like Matthew had in mind texts of scripture like that. For did you see the, the common word there, the rising in both of those passages? When Matthew comments on that in verse 2, look at Matthew 2, verse 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now follow with me. For we saw his star when it, what's it say? Rose and have come to worship him. It seems like at least Matthew has an idea of what's going on in the Old Testament. Whether or not the Magi did, again, what's the answer? We don't know. Did they have a book of the law, Numbers? Did they have uh, Isaiah? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. We just don't know. At least I think Matthew had this in mind. Others have suggested that the reason that the Magi knew that there was going to be some king born is because during that time, there was actually a commonly held belief, not just among Jews, but among everybody, that there would be a king rising out of Israel who would actually be king of the whole world. You say, what? Really? I mean... People actually thought that? Yeah, there's actually secular sources that cite it. Let me read to you a couple of the historians of that day. Here's what one Roman historian wrote. There has spread all over the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated that at the time for men, at that time for men coming from Judea, there was a man coming from Judea to rule the world. Interesting. Another Roman historian wrote something very similar. There was a firm persuasion that at this very time, the East was to grow powerful and rulers coming from Judea were to acquire a universal empire. Were the Magi influenced by such expectations? Again, maybe, maybe not. We simply don't know. What we're left with is this. Maybe... They heard the expectations floating around and were looking for some sort of star that would point them to a king in Judea. Maybe. Maybe they had some Old Testament passages that they picked up and they said, hey, this seems like maybe there's a king in connection with a star. Maybe. Or maybe God appeared to him in a, appeared to them in a dream and directly told them to look for the king of the Jews. Maybe. But the text just doesn't say. You say, Ryan, basically you've told us thus far that we don't know diddly. It's all speculation. I mean, we, we don't know where these guys were from. We don't know what the star they followed was all about. And we don't know how they found out that they were supposed to follow the star in the first place. Do we know anything? <coughs> yes, we do. Now, let me admit, the details are rather scant. There is not much here but when you strip it all away and you look at the sparse details 
there is something to be said. Now, in one sense, the Magi just appear, go worship Jesus, and disappear, kind of like the star, right? You never hear about the star again. It just shows up. It's gone. No more mention of it ever again. That's kind of like the wise men. This is a really significant point, though. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Would you expect anything different? Should we really be surprised that the Magi just get this little whoop and we don't know much and then they're gone? Because let, let me remind you of something. Is Matthew's account of the nativity about the wise men? No, they're just like a little supporting role. The main character is the baby that they came to see. That's the big deal. You know, Matthew, back in chapter 1, he's taken great lengths to prove that Jesus is the heir of the Davidic throne. And now he gets to chapter 2, and what is he trying to do? He's just propping up his argument to show that Jesus is the king of the Jews. The wise men are just another prop in the argument. They're not the main characters. They're just a little extra once again, just kind of walking through, and then they're gone, and there's nothing else. We really shouldn't expect to hear a whole lot about the wise men. And here's the kicker. What we do learn about the Magi actually tells us a lot more about Jesus than it does about themselves. That's the truth. The facts that we see about the Magi, the things that we really do know are intended to draw our focus away from them to the baby that they came seeking. So, what do wise men say about the king? I think they say two things. They say two things that we do know from this text. Number one, what wise men say about the king, the first thing is this. The king is universal. I'll explain that in just a moment. When the wise men come before Herod, they ask this question. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Where is he who has been born, what's the phrase? King of the Jews. That's interesting because are these men Jewish? So why would they care where the king of the Jews is born? Why would it matter? That would be like you, you know, packing up your bags, flying to Russia, making a long and extensive search and research and saying, where is he who is born prime minister of Russia? I mean, from your perspective, not my, not my prime minister. Who, who cares? So why would these men go to such great lengths to find the king of the Jews? Because the reason is, I, I think it's, it's readily apparent that these men know that Jesus is, is not just the king of the Jews. I think they understand that much because they have come from the east. And why have they come from the east? Just to see him? What does it say in the text? For we have come to what? Worship him. And this was not some sort of sterile, disinterested, academic pursuit. Look at the text again. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. After listening to the king, remember the star has disappeared. They come to Jerusalem and say... we. We don't know where we're supposed to go next. We've made this long journey. We're not sure where our next turn is. The king goes and gets the scribes. He says, where is the king of the Jews supposed to be born? In Bethlehem. He comes back. He tells the wise men. And after they listened to him, continue on, they went on their way. They start going to Bethlehem. And while they are going to Bethlehem, behold, the star that they had seen when it rose, the same star, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So when they see the star, how do they respond? Are they like, oh, well, gentlemen, there it is again. Let us continue on our cold and sterile academic pursuit. 
to follow this star to see what the anomaly is and be able to write proper research about it. No, the text keeps it up. They rejoice exceedingly with great joy. What is Matthew trying to communicate it? They were psyched. Yes, there it is. There it is. We've seen the star. Come on, Caspar. <laughs> get on your camel. Not mentioned in the text again. Let's get on to Bethlehem so that we can find this child that we have been seeking. They were ecstatic about the scene of the star. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, what did they do? Kind of walk into the room and they say, oh, it's just a child. <laughs> no, they did exactly what they said they to do. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Imagine the scene for a moment. Here are these influential and no doubt wealthy men who are used to the trappings of power. They were exposed to the pomp of Herod's court, and they don't seem to be terribly impressed, by the way. But here, in this humble home in Bethlehem, they prostrate themselves before a small child held in his poor young mother's arm. Remember, Mary was probably nothing but a teenager at this point. And they come in and they see this baby who they sought for. And they fall down. Wealthy men, probably, probably dressed in wealthy clothing. And they fall down on their face and they worship this baby. Through the worship of the Christ child, the Magi demonstrated that they didn't think that Jesus was simply the king of the Jews. They thought that he was their king as well. You don't fall down on your face and worship somebody who you're disinterested in, do you? You fall down on your face and worship someone who you yield your allegiance to. And these men come in and say, this is not just the king of the Jews. By this act, this is my king. Did you ever bow down to somebody you, who you had no allegiance to? Would you ever bow down to somebody who you believed had no authority in your life? These wise men traveled from the east, wherever it was, Persia or Babylon or where, who knows? Only God. They traveled in order to see not just the king of the Jews. They traveled to see their Jesus' reign was not just over this little territory in Palestine. Jesus' reign extended to the ends of the earth. And as you read the story of Jesus' life, that becomes more and more evident, doesn't it? He goes to the well in Samaria, and he welcomes this foreign Samaritan woman who Jews despised. Roman centurion comes to him, and Jesus commends this man for his faith. The Syrophoenician woman says, Lord, can you heal me? And Jesus says, no, I, I've only come to the house of Israel. And she says, hey, e even the dogs get some crumbs off the table. And Jesus welcomes this woman. Then Jesus gets to John chapter 10. And he's talking to the religious leaders of the day. And he prophesies of a day when he will gather not just his Israel sheep, but a sheep from the Gentile lands as well. John 10, 16. And I have other sheep, Gentile sheep. That are not of this Jewish fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. And then when you get to the very end of the Bible. And in the book of Revelation. And you see this great multitude around singing the praises of Jesus. You know what? They're not just Jewish. In fact, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, it says this, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. We can rejoice today, not simply at the celebration of the birth of some foreign potentate. We rejoice today. This Christmas time, we rejoice because it marks the birth, not of 
their king, but of our king. And the wise men give an indication of that from the very beginning. Jesus didn't just come for a particular type of people. Jesus came for people from all over the world. People like us who live in the United States of America who wasn't even a thought at that time 2,000 years ago. Isn't that good news for all of us? The Jesus that we worship is not just a king of a little slice of land. He is king of the world. Yea, he is king of the universe. His reign is universal. But that's not the only thing we learn about the wise men or from the wise men about the king. We learn that the king is unique. It becomes clear that the wise men thought of Jesus as more than just a great future dignitary. There was something very exceptional about this baby king. When they found the child, not only did they fall down and worship him. Okay, that's significant in and of itself, isn't it? They didn't just, they didn't just revere him or pay him homage. They worshipped him. But they presented this king with extravagant gifts. Look at verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, those gifts could have no significance. It's possible. It's possible that Matthew is just, you know, throwing in this detail to say, hey, they gave him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Isn't that nice? But as I read the Gospel of Matthew, that doesn't seem to be his style. In essence, does Matthew or any of the Gospel writers, for that matter, throw away words? They just say, well, this would be nice. And, but, um, throw in some filler material. It'll make this story more jazzy if I say gold and frankincense and myrrh rather than just gifts. No, I don't think so. I think generally when the writers of Scripture put something in there, they're intending us to pay attention to what it is. And I think we're supposed to pay attention to this detail about gold and frankincense and myrrh. And in fact, from the very earliest of church history, people have believed that these gifts have significance. They weren't just gifts for no reason. They were gifts that had meaning behind them, if you will. So what does gold and frankincense and myrrh mean then? Well, let me contend to you. I think they mean three things. First of all, gold. In both ancient times and the modern world, gold has often been associated with royalty. A quick survey of the Bible tells us that, you know, if you read through the Old Testament, it's, it's almost striking. You find that kings and queens and princes own gold, possess gold, wear gold. All over the place in the, in the Old Testament, when you see gold, it is, it is mentioned so many times in connection with royalty that it's as if God is trying to make a point. Gold is a symbol of royalty. And even today, don't we think that? You know, when you think of the crest of, of different rulers, what color are those crests usually in? Gold, you know, when you see a crown placed on someone's head, what is that crown usually made of? Gold. So when these magi present Jesus with the gift of gold, you already know from the text that they think he's a king, right? So this just reinforces the fact that they give the gift of gold as a gift that is fit for a king. What about frankincense? Now that's a little less familiar to us than gold is today. Frankincense is a white aromatic resin taken from the Boswellia tree. In the Old Testament, frankincense is almost exclusively mentioned as being used in the service of Jehovah. It was one of the components burned on the altar of incense of which the Lord said, listen very carefully to Exodus 34 here, And the incense that you shall make according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be holy to the Lord. Then you read later on in the book of Ezekiel, even when incense was offered to foreign foreign gods, 
Okay, so did Israel ever uh, commit idolatry? Did they ever do that? Yeah. So they take this incense and they offer it to foreign gods. And you know what the Lord says about even that incense? He says, hey, that's my incense. That's mine. Don't be offering my incense to foreign gods. And just as you read through the Old Testament and see this connection with frankincense and God, again, when the just as gold is associated with royalty, so frankincense is associated with God himself. Third, myrrh. Myrrh, like frankincense, was taken from a tree. It was a resin that was very fragrant. And not only fragrant, it was extremely expensive. Myrrh was most often used in the Bible in preparing a body for burial. So when Nicodemus came after Jesus was crucified, he brought with him myrrh and aloes to embalm the body. And you read that throughout the Bible where myrrh is often used in in embalming and entombing people, uh, taking care of their physical condition. So. Myrrh is often associated with man's mortality. So as the early church father Origen said, the Magi brought gold as to a king, myrrh as to one who was mortal, and incense as to God. How much significance of their gifts the Magi understood, again, we're left to say, we don't know. But I can tell you something. It seems that Matthew understood what was going on. Matthew writes down this and records this to show that the Magi were not just bowing before a mere human king. For not only had they taken great lengths to see him, but they did so at great personal cost. And then the story rounds out as if to cap it all off about the uniqueness of Jesus. The Magi, being honest men, think that Herod is telling them the truth. So after they see Christ... They go to bed and preparing to go to Jerusalem, we assume the next day. And what happens? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. (laughs) So not only is this child king announced by a star, but he's he's protected by divinely sent dreams. And by the end of the story, do you think these magi know that they have seen something not just unique, but something completely exceptional? They know that this child that they have bowed before is something of great significance. They know that he is king and he is more than king of just a little place. And they know that he is king and he's unique among all the kings of the earth. So, after stripping away all the the folklore, all the traditions, all the myths and fables that go along with the story of the Magi, what are we left with? We're left to see that they believe that Jesus was the king, but not just of the Jews, but of the world. And they believe that Jesus was utterly unique in his kingship. So, So, where does that leave us? Now, where... Where does the story of the Magi leave us? Well, here's my point today. My whole point of this little talk is simply this. We can't miss the greatness of Jesus. You know, you think about it. Was there a vast number of people who recognized who Jesus was? Yes or no? Right now. In this part of the story, was there a vast number of people who recognized who he was? Yes or no? No, just a few, right? Just a handful. I mean, some shepherds who the angel told and these magi. I mean, that, that's really it at this point in the story. Well, you got Simeon and Anna in Luke chapter 2. So, you know, however many magi there are, let's just say a nice round, a dozen maybe. What's even more mind boggling to me is this. Think about the story here for a moment. Where did the Magi go when they were looking for the king of the Jews? Where did they go? Jerusalem. And they ask the scribes and the experts of the law, the people who really knew the Old Testament well. They said, 
Where is he who is born king of the Jews? And did they know the answer? Yes. But Jerusalem, the people of Israel who should have cared, they just seem disinterested. They're not flocking down there to Bethlehem. You know, Herod says, well, why don't you go? And then, you know, when you find him, come back and let me know. It's not this mass exodus down there. It's this Cladenstein thing where not everybody is going there. And I guess from a human perspective, you can understand why that's the case, right? I mean, who expects the king to be born in a manger? Who expects the symbol of the king of the world to be a crude feeding trough? I mean, that's, that's not what you would expect. And so all of these people miss it. But the wise men are able to look beyond the external things and see the reality. They saw the greatness of Jesus, even though everybody else did it. Now, once again, before we're too hard on the people in Jerusalem. I would contend to you that it is just as easy to miss the greatness of Jesus today. You know, because the symbol of Jesus is no longer a manger. The symbol of Jesus is, is a cross. And who would expect a king to be recognized by a cross? Maybe even worse. It's not just a feeding trough, but it's an instrument of death. People may dismiss the cross as a piece of historic fiction. As a relic of religious fanaticism. Or even a warm story from their childhood. But if you think of a cross as just a piece of jewelry that you put on your neck. Or something that they hang in churches. Or something that points you the way to a religious establishment. Let me say that you are as guilty as the residents of Jerusalem in missing the uniqueness of Jesus. Because you know what actually makes Jesus unique? It's not his birth in the manger. That, that was interesting. That was unusual. But what makes Jesus really unique is his cross work. So I want to urge you here as I close to look again at the cross. Have you ever looked at something so wonderful, so magnificent, so great that you had trouble turning your eyes off of it? I remember standing at Niagara Falls one time and just watching the water plummet over that edge. And the more that I looked at it, the the more difficult it was to turn away from it. It just got grander and grander as you beheld the vast volumes of water pouring over those falls. And in a sense, the longer that you look at the cross of Jesus Christ, the grander it ought to become in your eyes. So whether you are an ardent unbeliever, Or whether you're just searching out what is this Christianity thing all about. Or whether you've been a strong believing Christian for 20, 30, 40 years. Let me urge you again to turn your eyes to the cross of Jesus Christ. It is there that Jesus bore the wrath of God so that sinners like you and I could be clothed in his righteousness. It is there that Jesus repaired the breach between holy God and wicked man so that now he receives us with open arms. It is there that the children of the devil who were destined to wrath became not only the children of God, but joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It is there that Jesus so identified with his people that we became his body and his bride. It is there that I was adopted, redeemed, reconciled, and transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It is there that the chains of sin were so shattered that all who trust in Christ now have the power to follow him. It is there that forgiveness was given, heaven was guaranteed, the Holy Spirit was poured. 
poured out. Death was defeated. Satan was crushed. Hope was renewed. And grace was lavished. Friends, let me urge you with all that is in me. Do not miss the greatness of Jesus Christ by underestimating the cross on which he died. Let us, like the wise men, see the baby in the manger and the man on the cross as uniquely the king of the universe. If those three or ten or fifteen or thirty-five wise men were here today, I think they would say to us, don't look at me, look at the baby. When I survey the wondrous cross, On which the prince of glory died. My richest gain I count but loss. And poor contempt. On all my pride. Look to the man who died on the cross. The king. Who came as a baby. And became the lamb of God. Let's pray. Lord thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus as a child in a manger. And thank you for these wise men who point us not to themselves, but to him. I pray that many here would get a fresh glimpse of Jesus today. That we would not be caught up in the traditions and main course. Lord, open our eyes to Christ. In his name we pray, amen.